Now going back to my job, if you remember that chart in the last video where I talked about hierarchical organizations, I'm bringing up the chart here. When I told you about different levels, there's the affected party. In other words, what's this company in existing for? It's got to be doing something for somebody or it wouldn't exist. So there's an affected party. It might be a customer, it might be someone who's receiving a service, but somebody somewhere in the world, either in the company or outside, is benefiting from what your company does. That's the affected party. Then you have the CEO, the executive management, presidents. Then you have that level of upper management, vice presidents, a dime a dozen. Perfectly disposable, but with a big sounding title, so they can grow their heads really large. Then you've got middle management, and at least in terms of engineering, you're going to have design engineers. Then you've got the firewall of human resources to make sure that the people down below can never communicate with the people up above, even though the people up above need to hear what they're saying to do their job effectively. Then you've got people like me. Now, you know, you got lower management, supervisors, people who do something like what I do, and then the grunt workers at the very bottom. Now, on the original chart, I put in NASA as an analogy, and I said that the the affected parties are the astronauts. Obviously, if there's anyone who has a stake in the outcome of a NASA mission, a manned NASA mission, it's the astronauts. Their lives are at stake. Okay, the executive management is the executive management of NASA, appointed by the President of the United States. Then below them, you have all kinds of upper management, which in a for-profit company would be vice presidents. Um, then you have middle management and design engineers. The design engineers are the ones who are designing the shuttle, making changes. The middle management are the people who are overseeing all of that design, coordinating it. Then you have some kind of human resource, again, firewall. It's going to be a bit different at NASA, but, you know, it's okay. We're not talking about HR in this case anyway with NASA. Then at the bottom you have, uh, at least in terms of launching and landing and running a mission, you have a flight director, specifically for landings, you have the flight director who's the one person standing in front of all those screens at Mission Control coordinating all those people who are sitting at those consoles. And then you have people like me who is one of the people sitting at the console. That's the analogy for what I do at my job. And then you have a bunch of grunt workers. You've got people all over the place who are plugging in wires and pasting you know, the heat tiles on the shuttle, they're sweeping floors, they're the ones who drive the trucks that actually move the shuttle to the launch pad, you know, the grunt workers. So that's what NASA is. Now the reason I brought up NASA, I never really said so in the last video, it was getting kind of long, um, I wanted to show the example of why these hierarchies don't work. So let me go... The space shuttle itself launched, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure it was 1981 is when it launched, Young and Crippen, when they took Columbia up for the first time. Four years later, well, five, I'm sorry, I guess you could say five years later, four to five years later, January of 1986, the space shuttle Challenger explodes almost about 90 seconds after it takes off. Seven astronauts dead, although they weren't dead at the time, they actually survived the explosion. They got to enjoy the ride down until they crashed into the ocean. Okay, that was 1986. 2003 in February, Columbia, that first shuttle that Young and Crippen took up the first time, when it's coming in for a landing, it disintegrates over Texas about 10 minutes before it was due to land in Florida. Another seven astronauts dead. The question is, how did that happen? If we look at this chart, folks, you'll see. Now, one of the things we benefited from was that Richard Feynman, the physicist, the Nobel Prize winning physicist, <coughs> excuse me, was on the, um, he was on the commission to investigate the Challenger disaster in 1986. This was just a few years before he died. Feynman is one of the few academics I could have respect for. Again, I, dis I disagree with his physics in many ways, but I love his, his enthusiasm, his love of learning, his fascination with the world he lives in. He wants to understand everything. He wants to understand this, understand that, and put it together and synthesize it into something new. His intellectual curiosity was, uh, was magnetic. Richard Feynman, that made him a very good teacher. Um, 
and he was a, he was kind of an oddball, which a lot of these people are if you're that brilliant, right? He uh, played bongos, played drums, and they put him on the commission. There, there's a book called Surely You're Joking, Mr. Feynman, well worth reading. Um, they put him on the commission to find out what happened with the Challenger disaster. Now again, the Challenger, it takes off in January, it's very cold, even in Florida, takes off, it gets up to where, you know, it's go at throttle up, it throttles down for a bit as it's going through a certain part of the atmosphere, then it throttles up, and shortly after that, it's going to eject those solid rocket boosters. And after the solid rocket boosters are gone, it takes that big main tank up, and then the tank, they basically are in space when they release the tank. The tank burns up in the atmosphere, the solid rocket boosters fall back into the ocean and they're reused. Okay? Now, shortly before those boosters were separated, when they went go at throttle up, the whole thing just explodes. And the crew capsule, where all the crew is, remains intact but the whole shuttle disintegrates. That crew capsule with them in it just suddenly, you know, obviously after the explosion, they survived it, it just starts to fall. And they can't see, it might have been tumbling. They were apparently alive until they hit the water. So it was not a pleasant death. That included the first civilian in space, who would have been in space, Krista McAuliffe, the teacher. Not a good way to die, folks. Why did they die? Now, if the Challenger Commission this was set up by um, Ronald Reagan. If the c commission that was looking into the Challenger disaster functioned like the uh, Warren Commission did with the JFK assassination, we got problems. Remember the lone bullet theory, the lone gunman, the single bullet theory? That one bullet fired from an impossible location went through and changed directions and went through all these people in different parts of the body and hit bone and, and killed and did all this stuff and then it comes out pristine as if it had never even been fired from a gun the single bullet theory Warren Commission well you don't want that for the Challenger because we get this all too often Feynman was put on there for whatever reason but it was a blessing to the nation that he was put on there because we might not have known exactly what happened were it not for Feynman Feynman was intellectually curious and he loved truth he loved, he wanted to know the truth. Now, I think he was wrong about some of the physics, but that's okay. He was trying to know the truth. And he made sure that we got the truth. Now, before I tell you about that, darn it, I have to take these gloves off to work the mouse. Let me go over a few things here about why I care about this so much. For one thing, in 1986, I was in the middle of my, well, I was at the beginning of my second semester of college studying aeronautical engineering because I wanted to work for NASA at the time. See, I didn't understand what NASA was. I only knew what I saw on television. The lies that Carl Sagan told me, things like that. I thought NASA was legit. It wasn't. But there's some other reasons here. Um, actually, you know what, I'm going to leave that for later. Let's go on with where I left off. If you look at the chart here, Okay, what it turns out to be, in the end, what happened was this. The, the solid rocket boosters, again, those are the two long, narrow tubes on the side. They carry solid propellant. Okay, and that's mixed with the liquid propellant inside the, the, the big tank to create the, the, you know, the, the thrust. That's where the flames are coming from. Well, as that stuff gets consumed out of there, that's why you can jettison the, the boosters they have different joints they're put together in segments at the segments they have what's called an o-ring an o-ring is basically a big rubber gasket just like you would have in so many things in this world i mean this this thing here has a little rubber gasket around the to prevent leaks in there you could call that an o-ring and i just spilled coffee on my computer and um... The solid rocket boosters were made by a company called morton Thoykal in utah now, NASA had a habit of putting subcontractors in every state. The reason is because once those subcontractors start employing people, then the U.S. senators and representatives from those states are kind of obligated to make sure that NASA's doing fine because NASA's now a major employer in those states. 
That's the only reason all this stuff was farmed out to all these different places. Why would you build a solid rocket booster in Utah when it's going to launch from Florida? You know what it takes to get one of those things from Utah to Florida on a truck? Why would you do that? Well, because people like Orrin Hatch, for example, the senators, the, the people in government, in other words, it's all politics. It's all politics and graft and corruption. The engineers at Morton Thoykal had been warning, hey, if it gets too cold, these O-rings might not work. They might fail. When they would have their conference calls with NASA management, you know, and these would be the probably the middle managers, the ones who oversee the design engineers, possibly some of the upper management, the vice presidents. You know, give me a pack of vice presidents, please. Dime a dozen. <laughs> Great big title, nice pay, and absolutely disposable. Just first ones to be gotten rid of if anything goes wrong as a, as a scapegoat. Um, <laughs> Kamala Harris. <laughs> Kamala, whatever her name is. Vice President, you see. Um, in the phone calls, they were telling NASA, look, these O-rings may not work. They may fail if it's too cold. Now, Florida is generally warmer than the, most of the country, but it still gets pretty cold overnight. At the time, the shuttle Challenger was being delayed, as so often happens, and it should, because you want to have a safe launch. If they can't launch that day, don't take the chance. Reschedule for another day. It's the best thing to do. They kept doing that, but for political reasons, they were feeling the heat to start needing to launch, just as the launch pad was getting the coldest temperatures on record. And don't forget, they're not just thinking of O-rings. They're thinking of every system on the shuttle, the launch, everything. Everything. The O-rings are just one tiny little bit of the piece. See, it's the responsibility of somebody in this hierarchy. If they feel that the O-ring issue is important, they need to raise the flag and start raising the alarm so that the people at the top listen. And to their credit, from what I can tell, they tried to the best they were able. But upper management didn't want to hear it. And I don't know if this is true or not, but um, Vice President at the time, George Bush, the senior, daddy, the one who probably had something to do with JFK's assassination, you know, Big Bush, he was supposedly going to be visiting for this launch. So NASA management felt even more pressure to launch this time, not to scrub it again. Now, I don't, I don't think Bush actually showed up, but there was rumors that he was going to be there. For whatever reason, the management who makes the decisions, the upper, the people at that level, decided to launch. In the coldest temperatures on record so far during shuttle launches. It took off. The O-ring under those temperatures failed. It let the hot gases out. It ignited and blew the thing to smithereens. Seven astronauts dead, including the civilian teacher. While all the students in the United States of America were watching that launch, because the teacher was on board, the thing exploded right in front of everyone's eyes. Now, the reason we know this is because of Richard Feynman. Richard Feynman is, see, what they do when they have these commissions to investigate disasters, it's political just like the Warren Commission report. How do you come up with something as stupid as a lone gunman and a single bullet theory for something like that? I've been to Dealey Plaza. I've been there. I've stood with my head in the very space on the road where John F. Kennedy's head was when it was exploded by a gun from that front. My head was in the same position, the school bu bu depository behind me. I've been there, folks. That shot came from over there. How do you come up with that? That's a political thing. It's a political thing. Who created the commission? The primary suspect in the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Right? The new president of the United States. Kennedy's vice president. He's the one who picked the people who would be on the Warren Commission. Well, when it comes to NASA and this thing, for, first of all, we were blessed to have Ronald Reagan. Now, granted, Reagan wasn't the powerhouse everyone thinks he was. Trump filled that role more than anyone, but Reagan had a lot of handlers and he didn't know everything. But Reagan was a genuinely good person. He really did care. And he didn't have any reason to hide anything going on here. So he did his best to get a commission that would do the, 
the job. But any commission is political. And as Feynman himself would say, if, if someone like him was not on this commission, they never would have found the truth. Because... Every time they investigate and they learn something, they have to consider what are the political ramifications of telling anybody this. Okay, we've got all these warnings from these engineers about the O-rings might not work. Okay, now what are the political ramifications? See, everyone else on the commission who are political beings, they're sitting there saying, well, hold it. That could have an impact on Morton Thoykal. They employ X thousand number of people. That could upset Senator Orrin Hatch. Orrin Hatch has a lot of power. He's on the uh, Commerce Committee, and he can cause this problem for us. So, see, everyone's thinking in their heads, what's going to be the issue if I... Nobody's just saying, what caused the shuttle to explode? This is the problem with hierarchies. Feynman, though, wanted to know why the shuttle exploded. And he figured it out, because he was a smart, intellectually curious person. He... Did, Hackney this phrase here, but it didn't take a rocket scientist to figure out what happened here, right? And Feynman, famously, he, <laughs> when they're having their committee meetings, he just, he just demonstrated. He just said, I have an O-ring here, and he had this little mini O-ring, and he had a glass of ice water. He just, like, bloop, popped it in there, and I, I can't remember exactly how it went, but it was just, like, turned to brittle, snapping, falling apart. It was like, you know, a child can figure this out. All you have to do is investigate, care about the truth. If he hadn't been there, that whole commission probably would have said, we're not quite sure. We think it might have something to do with the O-rings, but we're not sure. Because you don't want to upset Orrin Hatch. You don't want to upset Utah, the Mormon state. Don't forget, the Mormons are the ones who took over Howard Hughes's fortune. You see, there's, there's all these political things going on. But he was a scientist. Or, you know, he wanted to know the truth. That's, so, in the end, what happened was this. And Feynman is the reason for it. That commission report was a pretty good one. In the end, it, it made it clear that even though there was an engineering problem, the problem had been voiced more than enough times for it to be dealt with and fixed. Which means the problem ultimately came with the decision makers. It was management. They heard that this thing could fail, and they did nothing about it. They were the reasons those seven astronauts died management. And as Feynman said, when he spoke to other people on the commission, every one of them in their heart wanted to tell the truth, but they all felt political pressure. And in fact, what they did was they fed in clever ways, they fed information to Feynman, who's sitting right next to them, so that no, it couldn't be shown that the information came from someone sitting right next to him on the commission, because they knew he would tell the truth. And they were too scared to tell the truth. So if you ever wonder why they find the NTSB tells you that TWA 800 blew up in the sky and fell to the ground because an empty fuel tank exploded, even though you've got abundant dozens of highly qualified witnesses who saw a missile go up and hit it. If you ever wonder why they keep coming out with these government reports that are 180 degrees from reality, you know, a plane hitting a skyscraper caused the whole skyscraper to fall down twice on the same day. The only time ever in human history. If you ever wonder why these commissions keep coming up with these stupid answers, that's the reason. Even if the people on the commissions want to tell the truth, politically they can't, unless they have enough courage where they are literally putting their necks on the line. And I mean their necks. Something as serious as 9-11, you could be looking at a death sentence for someone on that commission or their family when you know who really runs this government, going back to the JFK assassination. So even if they want to tell the truth, they can't. Feynman didn't care. He just didn't care. It was a coincidence. Well, maybe, unless someone gave him cancer, it was a coincidence that he... No, he already had cancer before this, so, so he wasn't taken out. He died a few later from cancer. He'd had it for about six or eight years. Um, no. So that's the Challenger disaster. The report in there admirably said that management was to blame. Management needs to be fundamentally fixed. How do you fix it, though, folks? NASA set up as this hierarchy. Who's going to fix it? The executive director who's appointed by the president? Not elected. Not elected by a board of directors. Not approved by a board of directors. Appointed. 
who's going to fix the problem? What was it? Um, 16 years later, 17 years later, Space Shuttle Columbia is coming in for a landing. It starts disintegrating, really, from the moment it hits the atmosphere. Even by the time it was over California, it was losing pieces off of it. There's film from the whole country, people filming it, things blowing off of the shuttle. But by the time it gets to Texas, it had gone too far. And it just totally disintegrated. Now, at Mission Control, where they're helping the shuttle land, you've got the flight director and you've got all those people sitting at the monitors. My job at my job is similar to or comparable to sitting at one of those monitors in Mission Control. My supervisor is comparable to the flight director. They're the people who are bringing that shuttle in. It isn't middle management. It isn't upper management. At that point in time, it's the people on the ground doing the work. There's nothing a vice president can do to help or hurt that shuttle. It's mission control. It's all them for that period of time while it's landing. But they can only work with what has happened in the past. What if something happened, oh, I don't know, let's say a week earlier, that was attributable to a vice president or a manager? But there's no way to do anything about it as the shuttle's landing. Because that's exactly what happened, folks. You see, when the shuttle took off maybe 10 days earlier, the, the, um, the, the main tank, the main fuel tank, has all this foam on it. But the shuttle's moving at thousands of miles per hour. Well, if that foam blows off, the foam's moving at a thousand, you know, it's moving that fast. And it hits the shuttle. If it hits those heat, heat shielding tiles, it can knock those tiles off and break them. If it breaks enough of them, then when the shuttle comes to land, because you've got superheated gas in the atmosphere, if the hole in the tiles is big enough, the heat can just cause that to spread really fast and literally just eat away the whole wing of the spacecraft. The, the orbiter just gets eaten away piece by piece and it just disintegrates and then it tumbles and, and the um, aerodynamic forces rip it to shreds. And that's exactly what happened. Ten days earlier when it took off at launch and they had film of this, high definition film of it, a piece of foam fell off that thing and hit the wing of the shuttle and created a hole probably about this big. Or not a hole, but uh, necessarily, but it, it damaged the tiles in an area about this big. That's all it took to bring down the whole orbiter. So 10 days later, they go through their mission, they have a successful scientific mission, everything's good, and they come into land, and as soon as they hit the atmosphere, that thing starts heating up to superheated temperatures. And when it gets hot enough, the fact that those tiles were gone from that little area burned a hole through there. And what did Mission Control have? I'll give you. I'll try to give you links on the description here. You can watch. You can listen to Mission Control as they're communicating with the shuttle to the extent that they could, because they lost contact with them. Mission Control. The people like me keep calling into the flight director and saying, "We just lost tire pressure on the left landing gear. We just we are, we have um, off scale low." readings on the, uh, the engine, uh, hydraulic system, just bam, 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 one thing after another. The flight director standing there, he's used to a pretty smooth sailing. There isn't a whole lot they can do, folks. They can't fix problems, really. They, they are there to assist the astronauts to the best of their ability, but they can't really fix anything. It's not like they can tell the astronaut to unstrap, go outside while the thing's descending and solder in a new or paste in a new heat shield. It can't happen. But the flight director's coordinating all this. This time, the flight director, unlike any other time, was just getting these, these warnings one after another after another. And you can hear what he's doing. He says, is there any commonality? He's doing exactly what I would do. He's doing what I was doing on that phone call that I got blasted for because I was doing that. My supervisor didn't want me to do that. You see, he would have been a failure as a flight director at NASA. This flight director did the right thing, the best that he could at that time. He said, is there any commonality? Because what he's thinking is, well, what if there's, what if some wire somewhere went bad that's causing all these readings to be wrong, but the actual components are fine? Maybe nothing's damaged, it's just the sensors themselves that are having problems. So he's looking for commonality. Because if, in fact, the landing gear is blowing up, and the hydraulics are going out, and the engine's shutting down, and all these other things are happening, he knows that shuttle's doomed. It's, everyone's going to die. He knows that. 
So he, he's trying to figure out what's going on. Again, he's trying to determine what is the problem so that he can create a solution. Now, the context of, in my last video about hi hierarchies, when I talked about what happened to me at work, that's what I was trying to do. I was trying to determine what is the problem because I can't give you a solution if I don't know. What my supervisor told me to do was the equivalent of the, as if this flight director said, will you stop giving me all these warnings from the shuttle? Will you stop giving me all the warnings? Okay, if there's a problem like this, the best thing, what can we do right now? What can we do? Let's get a song with some, an album or a CD with some lullabies and play it for the astronauts. Let's try to soothe them so they don't think about how there's a possibility they're all about to die a horrible death. That's what my supervisor would have done as a flight director. Whereas I, as not the flight director, but a mission control specialist equivalent, I'm trying to figure out what is the problem. Is that shuttle really in danger or not? Is there anything we can do to save the lives of these astronauts? And mission control and the flight director tried everything they could, but it was just, there wasn't enough time. The thing was falling apart, and eventually, mission control didn't, they lost contact with the shuttle. They couldn't communicate with it anymore. They always lose contact with the shuttle for a certain number of minutes because of the ionosphere, I believe. But then it comes back. This time, it never came back. And everyone in there knew what that meant. It's like, okay, they're not able to communicate with us anymore, and they had all these problems. They were terrified. But they had to keep trying and see, and they kept trying to communicate with the shuttle. Well, the flight director actually heard about the disintegration of the shuttle from someone who called him and told him they saw it in the media. The media is showing the breakup of the shuttle in the sky. That's how bad they're telemetry is. That's how bad their information, their their situational awareness is of what was going on with the shuttle. This is mission control folks and they didn't even know that their own shuttle had just disintegrated. They had to hear it from the news media. Now whose fault is that? Is that the grunt workers at the bottom? Is that the mission control specialist? Is that the flight director? Or is that management? who provided them with some kind of 18th century technology for a space shuttle so that the flight director doesn't even know what in the world's going on with the space shuttle. He can't figure out what the problem is. And if you don't know what the problem is, you can't figure out a solution. So you got a double whammy here, folks. And if you listen to that audio, it's heartbreaking. At some point, the flight director, when he when he hears that it's disintegrated, the next thing out of his mouth, he interrupts one of his mission controllers and says, lock the doors. And his voice breaks as he says it. The phrase lock the doors in a mis shuttle mission is heartbreaking. It means the shuttle's been lost and we need to lock the doors, nobody goes in or out, and we need to save all information we have right now according to our protocols for a future investigation of the deaths of every astronaut on board. We could be here for a couple more hours just saving all the information. Just like that, the, the, these people are bringing in seven healthy astronauts, they're ten minutes away from landing and being safe and with their families, and just like that, with that phrase, lock the doors, everyone in mission control suddenly is instantly obligated, according to their jobs, to start preparing for their funerals and the investigation of the deaths. What a horrible thing. Now what happened in that one? We didn't have Richard Feynman. He had passed away many years earlier. But I will say they did a, a pretty good investigation and they were decent at pointing out who was to blame. It was management. It was the exact same management flaw that destroyed the Challenger. They hadn't fixed it in all those years. Management knew that the tile had fallen off. They knew that these tiles were prone to falling off the insulation and hitting the shuttle. They knew that when that happened, it could create a hole that is so big that the shuttle can no longer land. If the shuttle tries to land, it'll disintegrate. They knew that. They had seen that on many shuttle launches. The military had offered to, to have their spy satellites take pictures of the shuttle wing to see whether there was any damage. Management said, ah, don't bother, we don't need it. Never had a problem before. Installations hitting the shuttle all the time. Nothing's ever happened. Nothing's going to happen this time. If they had gotten those photos, they would have looked at that and said, oh my God. And they would have realized, 
we can't land this shuttle. This shuttle is doomed. And they can try to mount a rescue mission or something. The Russians can send something. We can send something. We can try to get the shuttle to connect with the International Space Station. Something to try to save those astronauts. But management just said, nah, we don't need to see photos of it. No, never been a problem in the past. Why would it be a problem now? And then taking it to an even higher level, why didn't these why didn't Mission Control have the kind of technology, the kind of telemetry to know exactly? Redundant telemetry, redundant sensors so that if a sensor goes bad, the flight director doesn't have to waste eight or ten minutes trying to figure out, is the sensor not working or is what the sensor's saying really the problem? If you have redundant technology, you would know that. You would know I can rely on it. Okay? Three different systems tell us that that, three different sensors tell us this is, that the the tires are flat. Therefore, the tires are flat. It's not the sensors. But NASA didn't give them that technology. That's management. That's the design engineering middle management, the upper management, the vice presidents, the executive management, appointed by the president. In other words, not qualified to run a lemonade stand. Appointed by the president. Not somebody who's qualified, but somebody who's political put in the position of running NASA. 14 astronauts dead, two-fifths of our shuttle fleet destroyed within the span of about 16 years, all within about 21, 22 years of when the shuttle started. Every time because of management. Management in a hierarchy. And that's the reason I wanted to point this out to you, um, which I left out of the previous video about organizational hierarchies. You see, it's not the hierarchy itself that is the problem. It is the quality of the people who form the hierarchy that is the problem. The buck stops with somebody. At NASA, it was management. Now, you would think, if you're just an ordinary citizen, you'd probably think it's a design engineering problem. Oh, the O-rings failed at a certain temperature. That's a design engineering problem. Yes, it is a design engineering problem. That's why the design engineers raised the issue and said, we need to fix this, you see. It's the management who said, nah, nah, that's all right, don't worry about it. Does that sound familiar for any of you who've listened to my videos about what my work life is like right now? Remember, I'm stuck living in this car. I can't get another job. I have to commit a felony to apply for another job. I have to put down an address on all these forms, job applications, W-9s, all these forms. Under penalty of perjury, I certify all information is true and correct. By definition, I don't have an address to put there. So I'm stuck in this job. This job is what keeps me alive, and if the job goes away, I go away. I'll be right back where I was, what, five, six years ago before I had this job where I was ready to just go out into the wilderness and let nature take me away because there's nothing more I could do certainly not legally now if I'm functioning within a hierarchy at work and the hierarchy is that flawed flawed in the same manner that a flaw that destroyed two-fifths of the shuttle fleet and 14 astronauts lives in the span of 16 years do you think maybe what I'm talking about at work might be kind of serious? Not just some homeless guy complaining about his job? You see? This is what I'm trying to get at. To bring this back to my job then, keep in mind the affected parties that I work with. Remember, my job is kind of like mission control, supporting the affected party. The affected parties for five years have abundantly made it very clear that they appreciate what I do for them. That I go way beyond what other people do for them. Way different, completely different way of operating than other people do. They often ask me to put, to connect me, to transfer me to my supervisors so that they can tell the supervisor what a great job I did. They often say, you know, in case any you know, you know, if I'm on the phone, they'll say, if anybody's listening, give this guy a raise. Or where can I tell them to give you a raise? All the time. I get the, for five years. 
The supervisors don't want these calls. They hate it when I call up and say, hey, I have somebody who wants to give me some praise. And they're just like, oh, I'm too busy. Just send them to voicemail. So, what did I get in terms of raises? I believe in five years, I have had two raises of 25 cents an hour each. If I remember right. Also, in my workplace, the bonus plan. Every month, there's what you can call it a contest or a bonus, whatever you want. But the people who do what I do, five of them get bonuses. It ain't much. But I'll take anything I can get. You know, it's about $150 down to $50, top to bottom. The, the problem with it is this. The way you get that bonus is by doing a different department's job for them. You see, there's no bonus plan whatsoever for doing my own job. There's nothing. So all, the fact that all these people keep calling in and or visiting or whatever... If somebody's trying to communicate to my bosses, Paul needs a raise, it, it doesn't matter. Or, or Paul should get a bonus. It doesn't matter because there is there is no event. I don't even know how to say this. I've never been in a company like this. There is no evaluation for my job. There's nothing. There's no bonus for doing an ex excellent work at my job. I get a bonus if I do this other department's job with good enough numbers. Now, does that make any rational sense to you? It doesn't to me. And yet, and yet, through it all, most of the months that they've had this going on, I have been one of those five. Quite often, I'm at the top. So I'm able to do both my job and somebody else's job not just competently, but a high level of competence. But not always. Not always. In November, remember there's five people every month. In November, only one person got the bonus. One person. You know why? Because there's a set of criteria you have to meet to even qualify for the bonus. And due to the nature of the time of year and everything, it's almost impossible to meet one of those criteria for anybody. It's probably it's just a coincidence that this one person even met it. I mean, it's just stacked against you to begin with. <laughs> it's around the holidays, you it's it's all but impossible to meet that criteria. So this guy got the full bonus and he was the only one. No one else got one. Now, I've observed this guy for a long time. He's not very good. He really doesn't know what he's doing. He's very good at schmoozing people. He's very good at pretending that he knows what he's talking about when he doesn't have any expertise. To me, that's not a good thing. That shouldn't be rewarded. But in my company, that's exactly what is rewarded. A rewards and recognition program for doing a different department's job. Folks, can, have you ever heard of that in your life? And yet when I bring it up and I say, you know what, this isn't right, this isn't fair, this isn't how this should be, what do I get? Well, if you're not happy here, Paul, it's an employment at Will State, you're perfectly welcome to look for employment elsewhere if you're not happy here. Hierarchical organizations. How good can the organization be if there are people at various levels of that hierarchy who have that kind of a mentality? How strong of a company do you think I have, just based on that one thing I just told you? That they reward people for doing someone else's job, not for doing their own job. And if you bring that up as being maybe not right, you become the problem, and you're the one who can go get another job. How strong do you think that whole hierarchy is in my business, just based on that one example? I've never seen a pyramid collapse before. But if there was ever one that could, it's this company I'm in. You can't make this up. You cannot make this up, folks. I am going to refer you to another channel. I'm going to ask you to subscribe to another person's channel. I don't do this often. Um, 
this one I believe is well worth watching. Now I'm not, I'm not going to say I have months of watching him. I have a couple weeks of watching his videos. Um, he, and it's not about homelessness. His channel is about aviation in particular. Okay, he's a pilot, and it's about safety and flying. Now, I'll put it in the in the description here. Make sure you go there and subscribe to this fellow's channel. His name is Dan Greider. And his channel is called Probable Cause. Now, here's the thing. The second time I ever flew in my life, I was 27. I don't, I don't know how old I was. I, I can't remember. Late 20s, somewhere in there. The second time I ever flew in my life, I got on the plane, I opened up the newspaper, and on the front page was... TWA 800 explodes in midair. And I look at that, and I look out the window at the wings of the airplane, and I'm just like, and then I feel the plane start moving, and I'm like, uh-oh. At the time, I was working for an avionics company, one of the companies that makes all of those gadgets and dials inside the airplane cockpit. I've never had the luxury or the money or I've never had the ability to get even begin to pursue a pilot's license. If I had a different life, I would have long ago pursued getting a pilot's license. I love flying. I love aviation. And I take it very seriously as I do with the shuttle whenever there's an airplane disaster. I have studied most of those airplane disasters even before all these TV shows came out that give you the overview when you watch these TV shows air crash disaster or whatever mayday when you watch these things you gotta understand that what you're seeing is a televised presentation you're not getting the whole story they often omit a piece of information that is very very important they'll often talk about a person either trying to cast blame onto them or to make sure that nobody does blame them but then when you go look at the real world off the camera you find out something very relevant about that individual that changes the whole perspective of everything you just saw in that video so if you think you're studying aviation disasters by watching these these TV channels that are talking about aviation you're wrong you're watching entertainment politicized entertainment. I care about the real thing, going back to when I worked for that avionics company, because there were things at the avionics company that went on that I did not like. Sorry folks, call me a complainer all you want, but if there's something that is wrong, I'm going to point it out. For example, if the FAA were coming in to inspect, they would sometimes take things that they didn't want the FAA to see, and they would throw them into the clean room up against the wall so that as you walk by and look through the windows of the clean room you can't see that stuff. It's not so clean anymore when you put all that stuff in there but the FAA inspectors weren't going to walk into the clean room. Things like that. These are the people building the gadgets that keep your planes in the air that you're flying on. I'm one of the people who again even back when I was a young man put my neck on the line to try to clean this nonsense up. I didn't stay in that industry very long. It was disgusting. For the most part, and I want to be clear, for the most part, you have people who are very competent, who do care, including management. I'm not saying this is an industry that's just full of mud and dirt. No, not at all. I think it is almost miraculous what they have done creating safe air travel. And there's nobody there who deliberately wanted to hurt anyone or wanted to be negligent. But when you're in a hierarchy, these things happen. Okay? You should not feel in danger of flying because of anything I say here. It's still the safest way to travel. But there are issues. And as they say, if you can save just one person, right? Well, I was trying to do that. Unfortunately, as with everything else, they don't try to save that one person until one person dies. That's when they start finally trying to do it. I knew from studying the space shuttle, even before I went to college, I knew the space shuttle's um, the commander and the co-pilot's control panels by heart. I knew where every switch was, what it did. I probably, and they didn't have simulators back then. They didn't have computer program simulators. This was all from books, diagrams, schematics. So even back then, I could, I mean, I'm not going to say I could sit behind the thing and fly it. No, I couldn't, but let's be realistic. But 
I, I knew a lot. I knew a lot about the shuttle. I knew a lot about its hydraulic system. I knew a lot about how the shuttle was built, designed. Okay, so this goes way back to when I was young, a teenager. My interest in aviation, the idea of a flying machine that is safe, particularly. Um, so, and the other thing with this company I worked for, the avionics, is that they didn't want to even consider potential problems. Okay, because it was political. It was just like NASA. If if I raised an issue and I said, well, under the wrong circumstances, when you're up in the air, you can test it on the ground. But when you t when you do it in the air, it's a different set of circumstances. I think we should test it up there because you might get a different result. They would just say, Paul, don't worry about it. We got it under control. Now, if a plane crashes and 300 people die, the next day they're all going to be saying, we got to start testing this up in the air. We can't test this on the ground anymore. This is the problem with the hierarchy when you have incompetent people here. Anywhere. People who don't care. They're not seeking excellence. They're just doing their job. It's the problem. So the reason I want to send you over to Dan Greider's probable cause is because he is someone who appears to be not afraid to tell the truth. He's pointing out what's going on with these air disasters. And I like it. I like this guy. He's crusty. He, he's offensive. His videos move like a, a snail with training wheels. But he tells the truth. And he's got some other pretty cool videos as well. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to refer you to his probable cause channel. Don't let the fact that his videos move slow scare you. Give one a try. I would I would actually say give um say the DB Cooper. You know DB Cooper was the guy who um, hijacked the um, airplane in the early 70s and then he parachuted out and they never found him, never found most of the money. No one knows what happened to him. He he just released a like 3-hour documentary on who was DB Cooper and I think he makes a really good argument for his case. Really good. And it's interesting that part of his argument is that the FBI is completely incompetent and overly political. Gee, who would have thunk it? Who would have thunk it? A government agency being so political to the point of being becoming incompetent? Who would have ever said something like that? Have you ever seen anybody on YouTube ever suggest that that's possible? <laughs> yeah, I mean, other than me, of course, for the last 200 some odd videos, but um, Dan Greider does this. I'm not saying he's right about his his D.B. Cooper, but I think he makes a very good case. And one of the ways you can evaluate his case is by the people who challenge him. He anybody who tells the truth, anybody who is um, confident in their speech or even aggressive, anyone. Anyone who tells you the way it is on something that they know, not subjects, I don't know aviation that well. I'm not a pilot. I, I love the industry and everything, but I'm not going to claim to know things about flying a plane. I don't. I don't. I've never even really messed with flight simulator games. Dan is a longtime pilot. He knows what's going on. So he has no business telling you what homelessness is like unless he's been homeless. I can tell you that. I have no business telling you what flying a plane is like. I can tell you how an avionics company works because I worked for one. I can tell you these things that I've studied. Okay, everyone has their own view. So, D.B. Cooper is something that he has studied for 20 years. I think he makes a strong case. And again, the people who challenge him, who don't like him because he speaks with authority, and whenever you speak with authority, you always attract a bunch of just trivial sniveling little eh. I mean people were saying calling him know-it-all Dan and all this stuff well you know what if he does know what he's talking about then he knows it all doesn't he he never claimed to know anything about homelessness he's never said a word about it but what he's talking about is stuff that's his expertise I have no problem with that why would I he knows what he's talking about maybe he does know it all so you can kind of evaluate someone by their critics as well if the critics keep coming in there and, and just make, just really just not liking this guy's personality, the way he presents information more than what he's saying, then pff, those people aren't worth considering. They're just useless. They're, they're weights that, that, that help our civilization sink into the quicksand. 
Those people, those people should be removed from society. They are the problem, not this guy, who's just putting out videos with his own understanding and opinion and on things. The D.B. Cooper video is very interesting. Please, I know it's three hours long and it does start out kind of slow, but he, in the end, it actually is a good package. He makes a good case. I'm not saying he's right or wrong. I, I, I think he makes a good case, though. Look at it. Another one he did was on this cult because this cult, this church, fake church, you know, the apostasy, the weight loss cult. So in Tennessee, they had this cult that was building a church, stealing everyone's money to, um, you know, based on, you know, the Holy Spirit will help you lose weight. I mean, that was their shtick. Every one of these has got some ridiculous thing. This one, you know, God will help you lose weight. And... And this hideously, horrifically ugly woman running this thing. Just, just she did so much plastic surgery or something. She just looked. She looked like she was in a car accident. Just horrible. But they were dealing with millions of dollars, and they were also starting to kind of hurt children. That's what got Dan mad when they started wanting to get control over children to abuse these children. So I highly urge you to watch that video. It started out being about the actual plane crash because the pilot who was one of the leaders of this church was not qualified to fly that kind of plane in that environment. Dan knows that stuff. Okay, the reason all those people died is because some big-headed cult leader decided to fly a plane when he had no business doing it. Now, most of the video is about the cult, though, which is fascinating. And in the end, if you look at the follow-up to that, Dan's efforts, among other things, did manage to help save at least one of these children. And I, people like me make these kind of videos, people like him, in the hopes that something like that will happen somewhere for somebody. 250 videos I've made, if, if, if I've had that kind of an outcome for anyone out there, I would be so grateful. But a lot of his, um, a lot of his videos, which are much shorter, are actually about plane crashes specific ones. One of them was in uh, Santee, California, okay, at this small municipal airport. I, that's where I worked. When I, was, when I was the head of that hotel, one of the largest hotel companies in the country, I was the, head of, I was the manager of revenue for that company. My office window overlooked that airport. I remember when George W. Bush flew in there and they had all these fake helicopters to take off in different directions so you didn't know which one had him on it. I, I watched planes take off from that thing all the time and I always thought to myself, this, something, this is a bad place for an airport, something's wrong here. Now, so on that one, which was recent, he started out the video by playing the audio of the plane crash. It was a corporate jet and you hear the pilot Again, folks, I'm sorry for the language, but this is what the pilot was saying. He said, shit, shit, ah! I think verbatim, that's what he said. He had to take that video down because people who are offended by reality told him to take it down. So you can't hear that audio the way that I did. But in my lifetime of studying this stuff, I have heard enough audios of people dying by various means as I'm studying, trying to help prevent them from dying, that I can hear that in my head right now. What the problem was here was when you come into land, if you have to do a go around for whatever, the, the traffic or the weather conditions or winds or whatever if you have to do a go around it means you're you're thinking you're gonna land but you have to kinda go up again and you have to circle around it's different than coming in and doing a holding pattern circling and then coming down you're actually trying to land and you have to abort it and take off again and then you have to curve around now every airport is different in San Diego San Diego's airport is like right at the, it's but near the ocean, but it's basically right next to the city, the skyscrapers. They had a major plane crash in the suburbs of San Diego, I think in the 70s or 80s. This plane had to go between two big kind of hills. And the NTSB, the ones who said that TWA 800 crashed because an empty fuel tank exploded, despite all the dozens of witnesses, very qualified, pilots, military, etc., who saw a missile hit the thing, 
The NTSB says an empty fuel tank exploded. Remember, the NTSB, like NASA, the leader of the NTSB is appointed by the president. They're a political person. They're not qualified to run a lemonade stand. They're not qualified to run something like that. The new NTSB leader, I believe her expertise is in bicycles? That's the head of the NTSB. Biden does it again, picks another winner. Good show. Good show, Brandon. Well, the thing is, as you look through these NTSB reports, again, if you don't understand reality, if you don't understand the politics that's going on out there, you might read these and say, well, there you go, there's an official report. A plane hit the Trade Center Tower, a plane hit the other one, and the heat from the fires caused them to fall right down on themselves. It says so right there in the, the reports, you know, NIST and all these... That's the government. They wouldn't lie. Oh, the TWA 800, just the empty tank, just boom, just decided to explode. Just like empty rooms inside your house frequently just explode for no reason. You know, it happens all the time. All the time. Oh, well, actually, no, it only happened that one time ever in all of human history. The one time that everyone said they saw a missile headed for the plane, because in all these other plane crashes, people don't report seeing a missile headed for the plane. You see where I'm going with this, but... He points out that the problem here is training. Training. Which brings you back again to my video of what I'm saying here about my workplace. The situation I got stuck in with my affected party, I didn't have training and I had no knowledge. I had no situational awareness. So I can't help the person. I, I don't have anything to work with. I just have a job title that says I'm supposed to help them, but I have nothing to work with. And the supervisor's fine with that. Just do what you can with what you got. <laughs> what? So the reason this plane crashed, folks, according to Dan, and I think uh, all the other pilots seem to be chiming in and saying that's very plausible, the, the people who really know what's going on, is that the, the subcontractors who do the training for corporate pilots, people who fly corporate jets, they cut corners here and there. They don't really emphasize some things that a pilot might need to know in a certain circumstance. For example, if you're doing a go-around, if you're about to land and you have to take off and you circle around, you don't want your plane to stall because you're pretty low to the ground and you're doing this sharp turn. Well, if you don't know how to do the math and calculate what speed you need to be at so that you don't stall, you're going to stall. And that's exactly what happened to this jet. And as soon as those engines stalled, what you heard was, SHIT! SHIT! Ah! And then you see this big explosion where the jet crashes on some people's houses and many people die. Now the NTSB, for political reasons, is not going to be the first one to say this entire industry is responsible because they keep cutting corners on training. No, they're going to say something like, oh, an empty fuel tank exploded, I don't know what, but the NTSB is going to come up with some stupid answer for why this plane crashed. Dan comes out and tells the truth. He says, no, the reason it crashed is because that pilot did not have proper training. And it's not his fault. He relies on these trainers and the regulators who oversee them to make sure that he has the training he needs. But he didn't have it. So everybody died. That's why I like Dan Greider's site. He had another one recently with winglets. You know, when you have the wings on the plane and you put those little things on the end there. Another plane that just <laughs> straight into the ground because of that. All right, pilots seem to know this, but for some reason the FAA and the NTSB government agencies can't seem to figure this out. I refer you to the description on this video where I have a link to Dan Greider's probable cause. I hope you'll subscribe and watch his videos. Um, God bless him for trying. I'm sorry he took down that video that has the audio of what I just you know, replicated for you here, but Everyone has to make their own decision on what they're going to do in a situation when people call you up and say, you know, uh, that offended somebody, you got to take that down, you got to, you know, how long, whatever, whatever. So, I give you that, folks, um, 
take a look at his channel, take a look at his videos, and you'll learn something. Do not rely, for heaven's sakes, do not rely on these television shows any more than the television shows about serial killers and how this person was murdered and DNA helped to find the killer. People do not put your faith in those things. They always omit very important information that could completely change your opinion of what actually happened there. They always do. Always. If you're going to watch those shows for entertainment purposes, then go out and with documentation research that particular case so that you get all the facts. That is entertainment. That is not a criminal justice course that you're seeing on TV. Likewise with these plane crashes, if you want to know why these planes that you fly on are crashing and your family fly on, it's people like Dan who's going to tell you. It's not the NTSB, the reports. The NTSB does a great, a great job in many cases. Again, I don't think people are out there aiming to just be corrupt to the core. But it's a politicized hierarchy. And hierarchical organizations cannot function when they're political instead of functional. And especially when the person who claims to be the President of the United States basically puts a bicycle specialist in charge of it. <laughs> I'm going to stop right now, folks. Thank you so much for watching this. Uh, I hope what I said here helps to clarify what I said about organizational hierarchies, all right? Um, come back for the next video. What else can I do but make videos? If I don't say it in another one, um, the way I've had to make these videos today, I've, I've overlapped. The, they went on longer than I expected. I'm going to do a lot of editing, so I'm sorry if these videos seem a little choppy or not in the flow isn't there as they usually are. Uh, it's because I'm kind of cutting and pasting different videos that I record into different videos that you see. All right. Thanks again. Have a wonderful day. And uh, if I haven't said it yet on another video, Happy New Year.